It's not coming on, huh? Is it on? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, the third time is a charm. Hey, we're going to get started in just a minute, so if everybody can uh, make it back to your seat. That was really nice of Alan Holstead to get these uh, pictures up. So we can uh, have something to, something else to look at besides our neighbors. All right. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, so how many of you are ready for warmer weather? Wow. But, you know, I was reminded this morning by Paul that at least we're not in Northern California right now in the Sierras. I guess they're getting about uh, 10 feet of snow up there again, and some of the highways are closed. Uh, this morning, Perry Layton was uh, sharing about when they first got married and they moved up to, I think it was northern Idaho? Northern Montana. Uh, that was really interesting about the culture shock uh, she, she and her husband saw there. Uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the yards had uh, elk and, and deer hanging in the backyard. A lot of the trucks had that. And uh, Marion and I kind of experienced the same thing when we moved to uh, John Day in the mid-70s. So there was, uh, you know, of course, the, the elk and the deer hanging up in the fall. And, and even the kids got two days off of school to go hunting. And another real clear uh, memory that stuck in our, my mind, at least, is uh, we attended a small Nazarene church right on Highway 26, east of town. And in the middle of service, we heard all of this lowing going on. And they were uh, driving the cattle right through Main Street. Uh, it was just really amazing, a really rich um, experience and you know we're, we're still in contact with a lot of the people that we we met back there. I want to thank um, uh, Don for the music ahead of class <laughs> and that reminds me that um, uh, Mert and, and Rod are here. I see Rod over there. He's gonna he's gonna help with the music later on. Um, just one other aside is that um, I guess it was Wednesday we got an extra day, an extra day in the year. It was leap year. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, what people do when their birthday lands on that day. And also, you know, if they have to add a, a day in the year, why do they do it in February? You know, why don't they do it in, in June or July when we can do something productive with that extra day? Um, I wasn't here last week. Uh, I was in um, Idaho visiting my grandkids. And uh, how many of you have ever cut your own hair when you were a kid? Okay. Well, that, it's, it's a really common thing to do. My, my grandson cut his own hair. And his bangs are like, they, they're about up here. My daughter said that he has a, a, a Caesar haircut. <laughs> Because Caesar didn't have any bangs. All right. Hey, so enough of that. Um, we have a, a special speaker that is going to come up here right after uh, we, we sing. Uh, Enoch and Janelle Richardson are here, so you'll get to hear from them in a while. So for now, let's uh, uh, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, um, we just praise you for your, your love and your mercy. We ask that you speak to every heart this morning as we seek your face uh, through the scriptures. Father, uh, just help us to be your vessels of truth, love, and mercy as we work together as one in the body of Christ. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to um, Willie and, and his crew there. Just, just, all right, just you and uh, Judy. What would we do without Alan, huh? <laughs> oh, this uh, two night, great songs. One, the one this morning is a chorus, uh, Thou Art Worthy. And in 1963 in Hillsboro, Oregon, this pastor named Dick Mills was in front of his congregation and he said, now folks, my mother is going to be here next week and I'm going to surprise her. She, he says she has successfully raised six kids. She played for the church of the piano, and she taught Sunday school, and now she's on a circuit of uh, women's conferences speaking, and she's just a wonderful lady that's written over 300 hymns and songs. And in the evening service, I'm going to spring it on her that uh, I need a suggestion from someone in the congregation about a title of a song, and I'm going to ask her to have this song written by the end of the service. Said the service lasted till 10 o'clock, and at the end of the service, she got up and sang and played the song, Thou Art Worthy. Does anybody know the scripture that song is uh, taken from? Revelation 4.11, I think or 11.4, anyway, thou art worthy. You guys over here helping us? Yes. Okay, this next song written or submitted to publication in 1787. It was sent to a publishing company with no name on it. And like we talked about last week, it almost sounds like it was a female that wrote it and couldn't put her name on it. But we don't know that. The original heading or the title of this song was Exceeding Great and Precious Promises. Exceeding Great and Precious Promises. And then years later, it was changed to protection. When it came to the United States in uh, about the time of the Civil War, apparently it was sung by both sides. The soldiers enjoyed this song, singing this song. But it was changed, the name was changed to How Firm a Foundation. So anyway, one of our favorite hymns, How Firm a Foundation, three, three verses. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. Excellent word, what more can we say than to you he has said to you for refuge to Jesus has fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O peace. 
not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned to repose, I will not, I will not desert to its folds. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, though I'll never, no, never, for never forsake. Thank you. What's that? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so now we're going to have uh, Enoch and Janelle Richardson uh, come up and share with us the work that they've been doing. They've been uh, in Central Asia for about 15 years, and they're going to share about uh, all of the good things they're accomplishing. Thank you so much. This is the room that we count on people taking what we say and praying, right? That's you guys. Great. Yeah, so 20 years ago, Good Shepherd sent us to Central Asia, and our kids were two, three, five, and six when we left. So you can add 20 years to that. That's how old our kids are. And uh, we just really praise the Lord for his faithfulness to us for these 20 years. Super cute, huh? I'm talking about that girl right in the far right-hand corner, actually. Keep going. Woo, baby. Uh, so there they are now, and we're real grateful for the Lord's work in their lives, his grace and his leading them to the spouses that they have. And our youngest son, Ezra, proposed over Christmas, and Lydia just got engaged in January. So we have two weddings this year. Yeah, that's us, uh, where we live. Uh, today, I want to just encourage you by giving you a glimpse of what God is doing where we are at in Central Asia, and to encourage you to both think and pray uh, for the world and the church globally. Uh, it's a little fact sheet here for you to give you a context of where we live. Uh, just if you know where Afghanistan is, just go north of Afghanistan. That's where we live, 98% Muslim. Uh, and yet it is where Christ builds his church. This is true. A uh, country about half the size of Oregon, 98% Muslims. So people ask, what's the religion? Everyone around us is a Muslim. 70% uh, of the country, 70% of the people live in a rural context, not in cities. Maybe about uh, 3,000 believers total. But we praise God for that many believers. It's awesome. Uh, so the people we work with, they are uh, Persian people. It's about 10 million people in the country. And they speak a language similar to what they speak in Afghanistan and Iran. Um, our little valley segment that we live in, we call it a valley segment. It's like a gorge. Uh, there's 350,000 people. And praise God, there's a church. We've done a lot of different things um, over there to be there uh, from humanitarian aid. The current thing we're doing is Apple Juice Project, and uh, you can see some of the video there, the grinder. Uh, we have been able to work for three, three years now, two full seasons, 
uh, putting together some natural apple juice. It's the only apple juice made in the country for the country. Yeah, many of you may know uh, Zach and Mary. Okay, well, we live in the same country, and we are on the same uh, business project. Nope, okay. that's not it. But that's okay. It's a good segue into the next, the next picture. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, so, yeah, we're just involved with that and involved with the people uh, that we employ and get to be around and talk about Jesus. Uh, speaking about that, um, what about you? What do you do? Well, we all throughout the world have followed Jesus can pray. We can lift up holy hands and pray to the God who saves. And so we pray for the lost in Tajikistan. This is a picture of my mechanic who had a number of opportunities, because they always break down, a number of opportunities to talk with about Jesus. I think he's working on your alternator there. Yeah, he's... Yeah, and uh, this is a picture here about, uh, just we're just giving you a picture. This is how we sit. This is when we go to someone's house, we sit around on the floor, and this is the, fam the favorite pastime is just talking. And so we just sit around and talk. And what do we talk about? Everything. What do guys talk about? Yeah, sports. We talk about soccer. We talk about politics. And uh, always try to bring it around to talk about Jesus because he's the reason why we're there. And we're glad we started sitting on the floor 20 years ago to get used Everything to it. Still, yeah. So we have many, many opportunities. You know, with a country that's 98% Muslim, we have always have an opportunity to talk about Jesus. We're at a, I was at a restaurant one time and distributing actually our juice. And uh, he said, yeah. You know, you're you're one of, you follow Jesus, right? It's like, yeah, that's right. He said, "What does that mean? Like, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus?" Basically, he just asked me to share the gospel, right? That's what he was doing. So, so that's uh, kind of like opportunities we have all the time um, in Tajikistan. That way, next picture. There you go. Yeah, and with ladies, very similar, just opportunities um, all day long in different places. We don't have um, we don't have the same kinds of events. Not a lot of programs or gatherings like this. You go day by day to each other's house. You connect in your neighbors' uh, homes. Uh, in the winter, you would you would only visit people between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. because there's not going to be electricity later in the day, so it would be kind of rude to show up when there's no electricity. So we do a lot of visiting in the middle of the day, but in the summer, you don't go visit until 7 or 8 p.m. So very different uh, with the climate and the seasons. We live very seasonally. Yeah, in this picture, there's a number of ladies, uh, some of which are followers of Jesus and some are not. And uh, one of the great opportunities we have with our little juice factory project is that we get to hire some people. And in our middle of our work day, we just say, we're, what we're going to do is going to take a break and we're going to sit down and read the Bible. And everyone's like, okay, that's not legal, but that's okay. And, and that's what we do. We sit down and read the Bible and we talk about it and we pray for our And within friends. the first week, they're reminding him, it's time to read, right? It's time to read. Yeah. So when our pastor eyes are broke, we got it. it's time to read. Okay, you're right. It's time to read the Bible. So. If you've heard about my milk lady in the past in some of our newsletters, this is my milk lady's family, and her daughter on the far right has come to know Jesus. We praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Uh, this is a picture about, uh, so church there, what does church look like? Well, church isn't that you have a building, right? Church is, it's underground church. In, in homes. We meet in homes. And this is a, a gathering we have uh, on the right. Yep, on the right, kids are getting ready to do a Christmas production. So Christmas time, they invite a whole bunch of people and our, our church services that happen normally in about 20 people, all of a sudden it's 110 people. And so it's a great opportunity 
to just talk about Jesus. And this is all local driven. This is what they want to do. And they want the gospel to go out and proclaim Christ. So, so those are the, the pastor's wife has got the pastor giving her little ear bunnies with his, <laughs> with his hands there. So we just are so blessed by their faith. People and their... love humor all over the world, right? So. <laughs> Great ladies walking with the Lord. Pray for the church. Pray for the women. Pray for uh, their faith to remain strong when uh, things are, are quite difficult for them to walk, for, to stand for Jesus where we live. One last picture before we run out of time. Um, so we've been there long enough where we've seen some awesome things happen. We praise God for that. One of the awesome things that happened is we've seen this last term, the first believer-to-believer -believer wedding. All the weddings there are arranged marriages, right? Here, that's kind of a strange foreign thing, but there it's normal. Well, this is the, the first believer-to-believer -believer wedding, and right there you see a picture of a service. They wanted, how do we do a Christian service? Because it's all a Muslim ceremony. They said, how do we do a Christian service? I, well, let's just... Let's let's make it up, and so we got together uh, with the local pastor there, and we we made up what a Christian service would look like in their context. I mean, praise the Lord. This is this. There's two of them now in our valley in the last term that we were there. Yeah, praise God for that. So um, pray, please pray for the church to be strong. Pray as it says in Romans chapter 10. My heart's desire and prayer is that they would be saved. So pray for the people there that they would be saved. And uh, our prayer cards are at the church office. And I think information in, at the end of this uh, session, there's some information on how to contact us. We're at the greenhouse right over here on church property. Love to talk with you. Blessings. Kid, kid, go ahead. Don't leave. Don't leave. Okay, so there's the information up there. We're going to leave that up for a while. And then at the end of class, we'll have that back up there. I just have two quick announcements to make before Shaq comes up. And I think, Shaq, you're going to pray for them. You got it. You All know right. me. All right. <laughs> Good. Okay, here are the two announcements. Uh, birthdays, we don't want to miss anybody's birthday to, to recognize them. And uh, Lori King, her birthday is next Saturday. So don't forget Lori King. Um, hope she's doing great. But I, I know she'd like to hear from a lot of us, so be sure and reach out to her. And we missed somebody last week. Uh, Rita Giancone, uh had a birthday that was missed on Wednesday. I think it's because it was um, leap year uh wednesday <laughs> and she's a lot younger than the rest of us because <laughs> all right and then just one anniversary to mention uh dave and uh karen near are celebrating they will celebrate their first wedding anniversary tomorrow are they here yes okay well all right they might be celebrating already <laughs> okay so now i'll turn it over to Shaq. okay thanks um, would you guys stand with me? And I'm going to put my wife on the spot. Julie, come up. Um, we had the pleasure of, in 2012, our first time overseas, to have Janelle. Uh, she was our first house guest in our home in Idstein, uh, followed up by her next time over was her dad, who had a heart attack while they had just gone up to the Stans to see them. He had a heart attack. They medevaced him to Turkey and then up to our house of all places, and then on into uh, Seattle. Uh, and uh, so we had the, the opportunity to host her. Uh, Enoch stayed back and, and kept things going. But uh, we have just a, a soft spot in our heart for them. So we're going to pray over you guys. Uh, and as a body, I've invited you to stand in agreement with me as we pray. So Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for those two believer and believer weddings. What a joyous experience. Balloons and festivity, but celebrating Jesus as their father, as their savior, and now as the leader of their home. Thank you for the pastor and his wife and those who are walking strong with you in that small church there in their valley. 
we pray, God, that it would multiply and it would spread to other valleys and across the range there in, in Tajikistan, that, God, your name would be exalted above any other name. Amen. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that as they are here right now resting, reconnecting with family, both biological family and the family of Jesus Christ scattered not just here but in other places, I pray, God, it would be enriching to them filling their heart and their soul as they return back, Lord, when it's time for them to return. But until then, would you continue the work that you're doing, Holy Spirit, there in their valley? Turn it upside down for Jesus Christ. Thank you for using apple juice to be a venue and a caveat that they can share Jesus Christ. Strengthen our brother and our sister, their entire family. Bless these weddings of their children coming up as well. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. We appreciate them. And I will echo what they said. It was always a joy when we had the opportunity to come back and share with you guys what God was doing when we were overseas. Uh, so I know when they say that, they mean it. Uh, they also know that you all will pray for them. So continue to do that as we do it. We're in 1 John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 5 today. And we're going to walk through a few of these passages, um, and then I'm going to add a thing to it. I was asked last week after class if I would share how to share your faith with people. Um, I've mentioned it a number of times as a challenge to each of us when we leave uh, here to be different, to be intentional, to be deliberate. Um, we will do that. Okay, not today, but we will do that uh, before our time is up um, in uh, March uh, because we've got the rest of chapter 5, 2 John and 3 John, and I believe there will be time enough for do that, to do that and just kind of walk you through some ways and some tools that would be helpful for each one of us to do it. It was kind of interesting is I had done that at the RMC on Sunday night, just the week before I was asked to do it here. Uh, and since then, we've had two of the people from the RMC share their faith. Uh, and then one of them, it's so exciting, she's a school teacher in public school. And it's apparently Black History Month. And she selected all of the spirituals that have something to do with Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're listening and their intent, and their focus, and she's getting to witness, uh, and it's just been so exciting to see. So here we are in 1 John chapter 5. Let's pick it up in verse 6 right now as we begin, and I'll read through our text this morning uh, as we open the word. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, and he did not come by water only, but by water and blood, and in the spirit who testifies because the spirit is truth. That's worth underlining there, okay? We're going to come back and unpack that a little bit. Verse 7, for there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. And we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who does not have the son, he who has the son rather has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Life. We're just going to try and unpack these verses a little bit more. I want to start off with this. There are texts in our Bibles and some of the translations dating back to 1700. This is some classroom stuff for us to understand. Verses 7 and 8 are not in many of the translations. Some of yours may have that omitted out of yours, or it may be in the margin. This was not in the original text. There are a lot of, of debates, if you will, on both sides. Let's just suffice it to say this. This is in the word of God, and it may not have been there, and many scholars believe that it was probably an overzealous scribe who was translating, because it does appear in the Vulgate, it does appear in some of the other translations before that, and they think it may have been a little overzealous trying to emphasize the significance of the triune Godhead. However it is, 
whether it's that or something else, verse 7 and 8 are this. Bank on this. They talk about who? God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if by chance or if by circumstance that happened in one of the ways that many people are teaching and believing and writing about, okay, but it all still is true. And it all still gives evidential proof to that of who the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is. So with that kind of on the side there, just so you know that, <clears throat> excuse me, because as some of you are scholars and studying the word on your own, that is something you probably have noticed and said, I see that in this, but I don't see it here. That's what's happening in that case, and we have that in a number of places. However, what we significantly see is in verse 6. This is the one, speaking of Jesus, who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question. When Jesus Christ was born, how was he born? Quietly, some of you are going, go ahead, somebody say it. The normal way. The normal way, thank you, yeah. I mean, it was, it was normal. His birth was normal. The conception was not normal, right? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, which is part of the Trinity, Trinity the Godhead. And you go, what does that have to do? Well, we'll look at that in a moment. Here again, there are four main schools of thought to this passage of water and by blood and by spirit. And we're not going to dive deep into those. That's going to be homework assignment for you. We're going to dive deep into what the text says and stay to that. But just suffice to know, there are four different thoughts of that that are predominant within evangelical circles that are taught. We're going to look at what the text says and stay to that. And I will dive into some of them just lightly as we move through here. But understand this. The testimony that is being given is that Jesus Christ was born both of water and of blood. And as Mona said so beautifully and so medically correct, a normal birth. Okay? She did not have, Mary probably did not have the ability to call and push that little panic button, right, for the epidural. Okay? Please block this pain and, and all of that. She didn't have that. In fact, in those days, death both for the child and for the mother was very common. And so in reality, when we really put this in perspective and we take it from 2024, where we have ultrasounds and sonograms and we can measure and look and all of those cool things that we get to see, they didn't have that. But what she did have, if we go back to the Gospels, when Mary arrived and saw her, her uh, relative Elizabeth, what did John the Baptist do inside Elizabeth? He leapt. He moved with joy. So there is some form of science, even back then, that showed that this is a baby, contrary to our global population belief, that it's not a baby, that it's a baby. And John the Baptist knew the beauty and the divinity of Jesus Christ who Mary was carrying. And Jesus would later be born, and when he is born, he is born of both water and of blood. Now, the other part that we need to look at here in the verse 6, he says is, he did not come by water only, but by water and by blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is truth. So what is he saying here? Again, within those four teachings of what the water means, some of them is just, they basically say it's just biological. The amniotic fluid, the blood that is inside of Jesus, and as many of you know, there is a school of thought that the blood that is inside the child is the blood of the child only, okay? There are others who teach it's not, it's a combination and combined, and there's problems with that even medically to think that. So the baby has his or her own blood supply, and so that is a portion of what they may be saying here. But the Spirit gives testimony to what he knows to be true. So let me ask you this question. Can the Holy Spirit lie? Not at all. If you believe in the eternal God, who is a, a true and living God, he cannot lie. He will not ever bear false witness, and neither would Jesus nor would the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit says this, again, we don't have that, if you will, in the academic portion of this time this morning, the, the which one is it, 
Is it a biological birth that they're speaking of? Is it a spiritual birth they're speaking of? Whatever. And I would have to answer it this way. Yes. It would have to be both. Jesus Christ was born naturally, if you will, with a natural, normal birth, who then was raised, who remembered Jesus Christ is the who? Son of God. He is known also as the son of man. Our identity as believers in Jesus Christ is in the finished work of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, correct? That makes us children of God. And as a result of that, Jesus Christ able to identify with the things that we went through and we go through because he was here in the, you got it, in the flesh. And because of that, Jesus Christ, as we know in the beginning of the Gospels, he is led into the wilderness by who? Remember, I asked this last week, so make sure you answer it right. Who did he lead? Who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit, okay? He led him out to the wilderness to be tempted by who is the ruler of this world. We know him as the prince of power of darkness, okay? He is globally in control of what is going on on this planet. Planet, can't say it right. As a result of that, he takes Jesus out there in the flesh, and what happens in the wilderness, in the desert? He's tempted. In what fashion? In the same way less as we are even today, isn't he? In fact, if you look at the temptation of Jesus Christ, there in the flesh, he was tempted with power, possessions, and position, wasn't he? You can have all that you see. All people will bow down to you. All of the things that drive us as human beings into what we consider success. However, there's one thing that Jesus did differently than many of us would have done or do do or have done. What is that? He quoted scripture and rejected it, didn't he? He stood firm on the, get this, the word of God. And yet, he was there in the flesh, blood and water, yet he knew the only way that he would be able to accomplish the plan of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit from eternity past to redeem mankind was in obedience to resist the enemy, flee from him, as we learn in James, resist the devil and flee from him, and he quoted scripture to give him the power and the strength that he needed, amen? As a result of that, friends, he was born of the spirit, and that could very easily be one of the teachings that, they, that people are presenting in there. That's why I say he was able to sin, okay? Think about that for a second. He was in the flesh. He could have easily have diverted if he wanted to, but he wanted to glorify the Father in his life here on earth. He wanted to be in obedience and submission to the Father, and he did the will of the Father. And friends, that is what he gives us there, but he also gives us the model there in which you and I today should live in. When we are tempted by the enemy to respond inappropriately, to think inappropriate thoughts, to look at inappropriate things, to do inappropriate things, when we are tempted to that, Instead of looking at it and seeing that the lust of the eye enters in and we take it captive and we meditate on that instead of meditating on the word, we will fall prey to the temptations of the world, won't we? But if we take captive every thought, as scripture tells us to do, then what happens is even in our flesh, we can be made strong by the spirit of God who lives inside of us. Amen? That's what we're talking about. The Spirit of God living inside of Jesus Christ, I believe, truly was there. When you look back at John and John the Baptist in chapter 1, beholds that Jesus comes onto the scene, and as he's baptizing him, we hear a very loud voice. It is not an angel's voice, okay? It is not an angelic voice. It is the voice of God who looks down on Jesus Christ, his son, in the flesh, but in the spirit, and says to him, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And you say, but he was in the flesh. Yes, he's also in the spirit, because he's the son of God. Jesus Christ never lost his deity in the position in which he had within the triune Godhead, even though he was here. 
because he becomes what we use a big word in Romans, the propitiation, the payment of our sin, because a death sacrifice, a blood sacrifice rather, had to be offered. How do I know that? If you go back and study the Old Testament and you look in Exodus, you look in in Deuteronomy, you look in the Old Testament and you see what God laid down for them to do, it required a blood sacrifice for what? The atonement of sin, the payment of sin. And Jesus Christ, when he shed his blood, physical blood, on the cross, he shed that blood out of love and obedience for the Father and for you and I so that as we enter into relationship with him, we become, if you will, in the flesh but in spirit with the Father. We do not become Jesus Christ. Don't confuse that. We do not become something we're not. We're still wretched sinners saved by grace. And yet... In dwelling in each one of us as believers of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, is that very fact that the Holy Spirit resides in us because of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And when the Roman guard pierces the side of Jesus, what came out? Water. So that is one of the other thoughts in here. That shows the humanity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and in that humanity, the physical nature of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man so that you and I can identify with him, and it's not some abstract thought, I could, never, I could never do what Jesus did. Yes, you can, by the atonement of his blood and the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. That's how you can resist the devil. You resist the devil by not visiting, if you will, his playground. You resist the devil by resisting those temptations, those things that look good to the eye, but we know in itself is going to be harmful to us. And as a result of that, we respond accordingly because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave his life for you and I as the Son of Man. And so when the Holy Spirit here testifies to that, he's given testimony to the authenticity of who Jesus Christ was and is. And as a result of that, whether you camp on one, two, three, or four of those points of the water and the spirit, the blood, and all of that, it really doesn't matter. Did you know that? What matters is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through the shedding of his blood? Because without the shedding of blood, there is what? No no remission of sin. There's no removal of it. And even all the way back to the Garden of Eden, When Jesus, or when God was there, and Adam and Eve had sinned, it cost the life of a living being, didn't it? And that blood was poured out because of the sin of mankind. Because of the sin of mankind, the blood of Jesus Christ poured out on Calvary for you and for I. As a result of that, we get to hold to that testimony that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, was the Son of God, and he is the returning Son of God. Amen? Amen. And that is what we can bank on within this passage. Verse 7, for there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. This is one of those that I mentioned earlier is is removed from many of the texts earlier and then later was added back in. Basically what is being said here is this simple fact, that the triune Godhead is real. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we go back to the, the analogy or the picture of John the Baptist as he's baptizing Jesus, Jesus is there in the flesh in the Jordan River, is he not? John the Baptist baptizes him, We hear the voice of heaven of God saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, not only my eternal son, but also my incarnate son, the son in the flesh who will come and make a way of salvation and redemption possible, but also what happens at that same moment? The Holy Spirit is present. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit give testimony to one another. And, and we see the imagery in the pictures, and many of us have either colored or taught the Sunday school story with the dove coming down, okay? The Holy Spirit is able to present himself in whatever fashion that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit desire. But he gives us that sense with the Holy Spirit that there is peace there and there is comfort. 
And it's the promise as well, because Jesus says to his disciples later, if I don't go, who can't come? The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, can't indwell you. Jesus could only be in one place at one time. And then when he leaves and ascends uh, there in Acts chapter 1, and he ascends to the Father, he ascends to the Father, interesting uh, freebie here today, how does he leave? How does Jesus leave? In a cloud. How will he return to get his bride in the harpazo? In a cloud. How will he return at the end of the tribulation? On a horse. He comes back to conquer. When he left, he left in the same way. And he will return to get his bride and gather them unto him. The whole thing that I want you to understand is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work in communion and in in harmony together. There is no conflict in that situation whatsoever. And it is proven not just here, but proven in so many parts of the Scripture when it talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the main one that should pop into your mind is in Genesis chapter 1. That the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit said, let us... You go back and study the Hebrew and that, you'll understand that us, that is the plurality of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let us make man in our, again, going back to who it is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in our image, our mirrored reflection. And let me ask you this. When God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit created Adam, did they make junk? How did they make him? Perfect from the earth. Created man made him from dust but he was the mirrored reflection they walked in perfect harmony with god the father remember that old hymn i come to the garden alone this was i think julie's grandfather's favorite i come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own now this is a hymn That hymn writer, I don't know who it is, Willie could probably tell us, he got it right. Well, Willie got it right too, but the the hymn, hymn writer got it right too. That's the beauty of the imagery that God gives us of the union between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that you and I get in relationship with them because as believers in Jesus Christ, when we surrender our lives to him, to Jesus, and we say, no more of our doing it, we surrender the things that we say, act, think, and do, and displease you. We want relationship with God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. We surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is given to us as our promise and is our seal and our protection, friends. A beautiful picture. God the Father loves you and I so much that he gives us that assurance, the assurance of salvation through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, nothing else. And we've mentioned it before, and I'll mention it again. The thief on the cross did not knit any blankets for any orphanages in Egypt. The thief on the cross did nothing spectacular for the widows and the orphans there outside of Jerusalem while he hung on a cross. The thief on the cross looked and he identified that that was Jesus and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He did nothing to earn the salvation that Jesus Christ freely gave him by the payment that Jesus was about to make on his behalf. And friends, we can't add anything to it, and and dare we not add anything to salvation? Even more importantly, dare we not add anything to this? The judgment that God is going to pour out on those people who are changing the scriptures? Scary. Somebody asked me, second thing free today, somebody asked me one time, do you ever get nervous when you're speaking? I really don't get nervous when I'm speaking. I only get nervous when I'm handling the word of God because I'm held to a higher standard for that. And it does scare me because if I say anything wrong or in error or confusion, then it's on me. And I never want that. That's why the Bible needs to be the Bible and leave the Bible to itself. And we dive into it as Paul encouraged the Bereans to do, the studiers of the word. So when you take and you you hear something, back it up with scripture, find it, dig into it, study it, make it yours. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman needing not to be, what does Paul say? Ashamed. Why? 
Because there are a lot of people pointing fingers and accusing and saying, that's not really what it is. It's this over here. This is more popular, so we're going to go this way over here. You know what? Vanilla ice cream is kind of bland, but it's still ice cream. And sometimes people say, well, I want to spice it up. Don't. Don't change it. It's okay just the way it is. Do you know why? It's the word of God. And he doesn't make any mistakes or any junk. Verse 9, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. When you testify to something in the court of law or you give your statement of something, you should be only stating the truth of what you know, correct? If I was to give you a testimony of what happens anywhere around the globe, I would not be giving you firsthand testimony to it because I'm not there. But I can give you firsthand testimony of things in my own life or in the lives of my wife when I've witnessed those things, and I can give you testimony and bear the truth of it. But if I tell you something that Les has told me, that Les got from Dennis, and Dennis got that from Arden, and Arden got that from Robin, is that a good testimony? One of those guys may have gotten it wrong. I won't tell you which one, okay? But there's no real credibility then to my testimony, is there? Because I did not actually see what Les saw. Because it's Les's testimony, not mine. So third thing free, prepping us for in the week to come when we will talk about how to share your faith. You are not responsible for leading anyone to Jesus Christ, number one. Did you know that? You are only responsible to tell them what he's done for you and in your life. That's it. And you give testimony, you bear witness to what he has done in your life and, Lord willing, is still doing in your life. And you give testimony to that and people see those changes and they see firsthand those things happen in your life. And guess what? That will cause them or lead them to a place to make a decision to either one, believe your testimony to be true or reject it. But know this, if they reject your testimony, that's on them. If they reject you sharing Jesus Christ with them, that's on you. Don't ever take it personally. Please don't. Because we know in Scripture that we would be hated because they hated Jesus. Isn't that right? They despised Jesus so much because the Pharisees saw what Jesus was doing, the following he was getting. And so what do they do? They eradicate him. Get rid of the problem. Well, nothing's changed, has it? They try and eradicate believers all the time. And over in, in Iran in particular, week after week, martyrs are losing their life for Jesus Christ because they're standing up and proclaiming the truth of who Jesus is. Friends, that's the testimony that he's talking about. The testimony that God gave, gives is a true testimony. It's a testimony that you can count on, and even so much so, you can put it in the bank. It is so solid because it is the word of God. The New Testament and the Old Testament are also the Word of God. That is why we study the Word of God. We look at the Word of God and see what it says. There's all kinds of great self-help books out there. But you know what? Those self-help books and Oprah's books and everybody else's books won't get you into heaven. Just the blood of Jesus Christ. And the testimony of a living God who has changed and redeemed and saved us from an eternity separated from him. He goes on, anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to, believes God rather, has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. We have that first testimony and that testimony is given to us in John when John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus. We also see the second testimony of who Jesus was because while Jesus was on the cross for that split second when Jesus Christ took all of the sins, past, present, and future, onto his body and he died for us for that brief moment, a holy, just, loving God could not look upon his son anymore because the son of God, the son of man, bore all of our transgressions, 
all of our sins. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried and rose again, and we begin to get our position within Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, God sees you and I through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He no longer sees you and I as horrible, wretched people. Although we look in the mirror and we still know those things that are going on. But by grace, God has saved us through faith in Christ Jesus. And the work that Jesus Christ is giving the testimony to who he is. And for that brief moment, God the Father had to turn his eyes from his own son because he could not see the sin that he was carrying for you and I. Testimony to who Jesus Christ really, truly was. When we make God out to be a liar, when we don't accept God for who he is and what he has said, friends, that's a very scary position to be in. If you've ever been called a liar for whatever reason or fashion at all, you know the hurt and the pain that causes. Or if you've ever been lied to, you know the hurt and the distrust that comes into play into that. That is the kind of thing that we do if we say, God, you're not real. I don't believe in you. Well, it's interesting as you think about that. I do believe that God is real. I believe he is in heaven. I believe that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father interceding on my behalf. I believe in the Holy Spirit living inside of me, empowering me, indwelling me, correcting me, guiding me, all of those things that the Holy Spirit does. The atheist says they don't believe in God and they don't believe in anything. You know what they do? They believe in everything because they'll accept everything to be true. So a true atheist actually has to have more faith than you and I do, because we have the faith, as Jesus said to the disciples, of a child, simple faith. Those of us who've had children, you've grandchildren, aunts or uncle, and you've taken the child to the pool, and they're standing on the edge of the pool wanting to get in, but they're too afraid, and you're in the water, and you're only up to about your waist, and what are you doing? You're encouraging them to jump into your arms, right? They want to trust you. Don't ever just let them fall. It breaks the trust. But God the Father is inviting each and every one of us into relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And he's saying, enter into that relationship with me. That invitation is there. And when we choose to say, God, you're a liar. I don't believe that. I don't believe that you can do that. Or even to the point, believe it or not, I think that believers in Jesus Christ can also accuse God of of not telling the truth by saying to him, God, I want you to change me. Uh, And when when we don't see the change the way we want to, we blame God, don't we? God, would you take this away from me? Paul three times prayed that God would take away the thorn in his flesh the thing that was irritating to him, that was debilitating him, that he felt that if God would remove those, he could probably do more things for the kingdom of God. But for whatever reason, God in his infinite wisdom, Paul cries out to him and says, remove this from me. God allowed it to stay so that it would bring honor and glory to his name. And Paul continued to honor and glorify God in his ministry. Even though he asked And if Paul would have just said, God's a liar, he's not going to follow through, he's not going to do it my way, well, remember this, it's either God's way or the highway. It's not our way. We have to rely on God to do the work. That is part of who he is. He is God. And as a result of that, his testimony is true, and it's authentic, and it's real, and it's genuine. And friends, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never be able to pluck you out of my father's hand, Jesus says. The hand which is bigger than mine, and I've got a big hand. When somebody of my little grandkids are holding my hand, I'm not going to let anybody take them out of my hand. God's hand is much bigger. He has made promises, friends, and he is not a liar. The enemy wants to cause us to doubt. And that's the point I was trying to make earlier is that when we try and we say, well, God, do this for me and I'll believe you are who you really are. God, do this for me and God doesn't do it. That may be his plan. 
because it may be something he wants us to grow in our faith in him. Paul obviously had to surrender finally and say, okay, I'll live with this thorn in the flesh, this irritant, this distraction, but I'm going to give you honor and glory and praise, Lord. You see, we do that when we understand that God is ultimately true, and he is real, and he is loving, and he is just. Dare we never, ever call God a liar. Verse 11, and this is the testimony, and I love this. This is worth highlighting. This is worth memorizing, and it is definitely worth holding on to. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Think about the magnitude of that. We have a very difficult time in our minds putting a a limit on eternity. But how long is eternity? We really don't know. Sometimes it's the time of making the phone call to get a doctor's appointment and seven and a half months later getting it, right? We've all been in that place in the last couple of years. But the reality is that's not eternity. And for years as a child, we're growing up thinking, oh, I can't wait to get older. Any of you wish that wish hadn't come true? I do with the aches and pains. But the reality is, is that if you really understand that eternity, past, present, and future is the way my mind has to wrap around it, there is no end to it. It's, if you will, imagine putting a marker at the very top of the corner of this building, and you begin to draw a line, and you can draw it straight, which I couldn't, and you drew it straight all the way around and continued around, and when you got to that line, you just dropped down just a smidgen, and you continued that line, and you, that's, that's not even eternity. But when you visualize that, you're going, that's a lot of lines. That's a long time. How many, of us, how many of us can even relate to thinking about things that happened in the 1700s? We read about it, and that was a long time ago. But I was reading just this week in scriptures of stuff that happened 7,000 years ago. And you begin to look at that, and you go, wow. This is a God who provides for you and I eternal life. Why? Because we put our trust in his son who died for us in our place to give us eternal life. Turn to John chapter 3. We've looked at it because there's so many parallels in these passages. But it's understanding that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life. And you are living in that framework, I believe, even right now. John is recording for us the encounter with Nicodemus in chapter 3, but beginning in verse 16, our most quoted verse used at sporting events all over the world, (laughs) quoted so quickly that we miss words or we mix it up from the King Jimmy that we learned it in to the NASB to the NIV and we can't get it right. But read And follow along as I read these next few verses. And as I read them, I want you to think of it in light of eternity. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. 
But whoever lives by the truth comes in to the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. You see, eternal life is given to you and I when we surrender our hearts and our will and our minds to Jesus Christ and we say, we can't do it. Only you can do it, Jesus. And how does Jesus do it? He did it on Calvary 2,000 plus years ago when he died on the cross and he paid the sin or the debt for sin that separated us from a holy God. And because of that, we have been given the most incredible gift that can ever be given. Salvation. And out of that, through that, rather, salvation comes the ability to have a relationship with a holy God now, eternity present, if you will, into eternity future. And you say, but it says here that you won't perish. You'll still die. Scripture is very clear. It's accounted unto one, a man once to die, and after that, what? The judgment. What did you do with Jesus Did you accept him? Did you reject him? Is your name recorded in the Lamb's book of life? And as a result of that relationship that we have today with Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have that relationship, you have that promise that, yes, you will die here on earth. And if you die tomorrow anticipating the harpazo, the rapture of Jesus Christ and the taking of his church to be with him, if you die tomorrow and you miss it, good for you. Hallelujah. I'll sign up for that one. The reality is, though, you will be immediately in the eternal presence of God the Father. Friends, it's because he is not a liar. He's not. He's told you he's going to do this, friends. He's already paid the price for your sins so that you can have that relationship through Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, we now enter into it now, and we will live on into eternity in the very presence of God. Is that not exciting? That's the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. Well, it's actually one of many, isn't it? The joy of anticipation of being with him forever. The joy and anticipation of singing with the 24 elders and the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's going to be joyous. And my voice won't crack. And it won't matter if we do a key change. It won't matter if I'm off, because I won't be. Because it will be in the very presence of God, who will, because of my relationship with Jesus Christ, will give to me eternal life. And until that day comes, friends, he also gives us forgiveness of sin. The ability to stand before God right now holy and just through the work of Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. So when our world tells us, I can't believe in a God that would send people to hell, take them to 1 John chapter 5 and take them to John chapter 3. To show them that God is not a liar, that God is compassionate and he's loving. In fact, he is so compassionate, he is long-suffering, isn't he? He wants that none should perish. But the reality is there are people who will say, I don't believe in him, he's a liar. And the sad part is the tragic situation for them is they will be separated for eternity on their own choosing from a God who loves them. That's hard. And it is a very unpopular thing in our culture today. That's a horrible thing to tell people, at least they think. But you know what? That's even more horrible than hearing you have the worst disease that is known to man. And there are a lot of diseases out there that are horrible. None of them compare to eternity separated from Jesus Christ. God came through the birth of Jesus Christ, provided by the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, an opportunity for each of us to know him and have eternal life. So let me finish this with this last part going back to 1 John chapter 5. God has given us eternal life, 
and this life is in his son. He who has the son, he who has a relationship with Jesus Christ, and and, and hold on to that. He who has the son has life, but he who does not have the son of God does not have life. No matter what the world says, if you have more and more and more, you know you're never satisfied. Do you remember the Lay's potato chip back in the 90s with Larry Bird and uh, I don't remember the other guy, but he dared him, you can only, can't just eat one. I've yet to meet somebody. Somebody will come up to me this morning and tell me, I'm I'm the only one, but, but I'll probably challenge you. The reality is they'll say you can only eat one potato chip. You know what? That salt hits your body and you want more. That's why it's there. You don't have life until you really have Jesus Christ. Because just like that one potato chip, the world tells you you need to have more. 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 Did you notice something in the pictures that Janelle and Enoch showed us? The homes were fairly simple, weren't they? There wasn't a whole lot in there. But... That's not the first time I've heard Enoch and Janelle say the thing about being in their homes is the conversation, the fellowship. The world will tell you you've got to have everything. And they look at us in Western civilization and they go, you guys are greedy. You guys have got to have the latest and the greatest and the more and the bigger and the better. The reality is, no, what we really need is a lot more of Jesus and a lot lot less of me. And friends, if we would understand that and hold on to that truth, Jesus Christ came to seek and to save those who were lost. And of those, I was one of them. And so were many of you. Here's the challenge I have for us this week. What will you do knowing you have right now eternal life? Do you ever think about that? You, you've been given it. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you received eternal life because of what Jesus has done. We're not living in eternity with him yet, but you have that. That's one of the promises he's given to you. What are you doing with that gift? Because I guarantee you, if if somebody gave you a million dollars and said, you can't spend it on yourself, you have to give it away, you would find people that needed it, wouldn't you? You have even something better than a million dollars. You have the cure for eternal separation from God. And friends, there are people that we know, and very possibly somebody even here or online that's watching who doesn't know Jesus as Savior. What will you do with that? Will you keep it? God wants you to give it away. It was his gift that he gave to us. Let's give it away. Let's pray. Father, I'm mindful that Everything we have has come from you. The joy as we heard Janelle and Enoch share of those believer-on-believer wedding ceremony. That's after years and years, Father, of ministering and loving and, and sharing and not seeing a whole lot of results. And yet they've committed themselves to sharing that love of Jesus Might we, Father, in our own way, prompted by you, Holy Spirit, this week, give testimony that you're a true God, a loving God, a caring God, a compassionate God. And may we also give testimony this week to somebody about the love of Jesus Christ who came to pay the debt that they and we couldn't pay for our own sins. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would empower each one of us as we leave from here this morning, as we go into this week. Might you direct and guide our steps and our conversations that we would be giving testimony that you are a God of life, not a God of lie, that you are a God of love, and that through you, we can know your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, for anyone who hears my voice this morning and has never given their life to you, I pray that they would pray this simple prayer, Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. 
I would like to receive right now the gift you've given to me of salvation, eternal life, and forgiveness of sin. I receive that gift, and I want to give my life to you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would allow that person to make contact with another believer that we might follow up with them. And Lord, cause us to be bold ambassadors and missionaries everywhere we go this week for the kingdom's sake, and we'll give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next Sunday. I want to remind everybody, um, Janine.